Um, my name is Enrique Mendizabal. You um, will see me for just a few more seconds. And I just wanted to welcome um, Julia Pomares from CPEC in Argentina and Karen von Hippel from Rusi in the UK, um, who will be leading this, um, this very interesting session looking at changing think tanks. Um, and so I leave you to Julia and Karen to it. And thank you very much for uh, hosting the session for us. Well, thank you, Enrique. Maybe I'll start and quickly introduce myself and then I'll hand it over to Julia and then we'll start maybe a conversation if that works. Um, so just, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, I've been, I'm, RUSI is the world's oldest think tank. It was founded in, in uh, 1831 by the Duke of Wellington. And it was very traditionally a, a, a military sciences focused think tank. And it's obviously changed a lot in its 189 plus years history. Um, but um, I'm the first, uh, I'm the first female director, and I'm the first foreigner to run RUSI. I'm, I'm American, but I also have a German passport, and I'm the, I'm the second civilian to run RUSI. So it's it's quite a, it was quite a bit of a shock in some ways for people when they hired me. But I think it was, you know, irrespective of my skills and capability, I think it was a good idea to shock the system a bit by bringing in somebody different. But let me turn it to you, Claudia. Thank you, Karin. Very nice talking to you. My name is Julia Bamares. I'm the executive director of CPEC. I've been leading CPEC for the last five years and I will be doing so for the next 10 days <laughs> because I'm, I'm leaving CPEC uh, the early May and starting a job at the government of the city of Buenos Aires. So I'm quite, as I was telling Karin, I was, I'm quite mobilized to be here for probably the last public event that I'm representing CPEC. I've been in CPEC for 10 years and CPEC is 20 years old. So half of, of uh, CPEC's life and very happy to be here. And congratulations, Kiki and all the OTT team for this uh, uh, fascinating event. Yeah, can I also thank yeah, Enrique and uh, Julia and others for inviting me. I was looking forward to this event more than almost anything else that I do at RUSI because I just thought it was such a cool idea to have people from different think tanks conversing about how things are changed. So I guess if, if I could start out, Julia, if you would permit me to ask you the first question, tell, tell us a yeah. bit about how your think tank has changed in COVID. Yes, I think we changed, um, we changed in terms of obviously our agenda, in terms also of our funding, uh, well, and uh, obviously in terms of how we work because we had to switch to uh, remote uh, working. Uh, I think that the first days well, we we enter the pandemic mode in I think it was March eleventh, uh, right? When when it was uh, declared the pandemic, and CPEC has an annual event that uh, takes place every year, and it's a very big fundraising event for us, and also uh, an event where the uh, leaders from all political parties and also from business leaders and media leaders come for this big uh, event and it was going to take place by the end of March so it was a big shock for us in, in many many ways it's a, obviously uh, in terms of funding but also it's uh, an event where we position our, our messages and our agenda and we the first days were very difficult I think it were very difficult for all of us to get into this new uh, uh, mode of life and we took the decision to uh, get three or four big issues in which we thought that CPEC could make uh, a difference. Uh, one of them was supporting Argentine Congress to be able to virtually uh, legislate and, uh, and actually Argentinian Congress was one of the first, I think it was the 16th Congress all over the world to have uh, uh, new rules for uh, legislating remotely. So I think that uh, our big decision was to decide some big issues in which we could make a difference. One was uh, institutional uh, strengthening and another one has to do with the impact of COVID on poverty and inequality and the measures to overtake uh, that. And, and also it was very important for us to change the way we, we work remotely and, and it was a good, I think it was also um, once all this nightmare is finished, we will realize that it was a big um, uh, speed up of our digitalization internally. Right. Uh, I don't know. I know how it was at, at, at your uh, place in Rusi, Karin. How, has to has something of this uh, to do with what happened there? 
Yeah, I mean, exactly the same thing, you know, acceleration of things that we were planning on doing, but very yeah. slow off the mark. And in fact, we had just moved, we, we had this beautiful old building on Whitehall that was built in 1896 for us, and we're, we've shut it down to renovate it. So we had moved into this uh, <clears throat> temporary space, and the space is quite nice. And we were setting up so we'd have, you know, capability to do online things there, but we were quite slow in getting off the, the, the mark. Um, so for us, I think it's probably the same for most think tanks. I think we were quite lucky in that our business model can adjust to working from home quite easily. You know, universities, I feel very bad for them because they have all these students that they have to figure out how to manage and the kids are paying all this money to go and do they want to pay money to watch TV and can they go on campus? Mm -hmm. We are quite lucky because our model is we do research mm -hmm. and we can do events and all of that you can do from home. So, you know, like you, it took us a few weeks we were really nervous initially. We were in the middle, that's the start of our budget year. So we were just about to give people, you know, promotions and raises. And so we basically halted all the raises for people, all the senior people just had their salaries frozen. And we gave some of the junior people, uh, you know, some, some uh, additional boost to their salary, but everyone else, because we weren't sure how we would do financially back then. And then, so it turns out actually we've managed to grow. We haven't grown at the same degree we had previously, but we've done quite well. I mean, I think both of us probably have captive audiences because everyone's trapped at home. And so they can they can join online sessions a lot easier. And, you know, we were joking today because normally in the good old days, you'd have to organize an event three or four months. And if you want people to fly in, it gets all complicated. We can organize an online Zoom event within a day or two, and you can still have a full house because, you know, people don't have to do much besides turn their their, their computer on. So I, I, I'm assuming those are similar similar issues that you guys face as well, right? Yes, but it also has. I was reflecting what, what you were talking, Karin, that for us it was it was great to start having more uh, global conversations and and we, this work that we we've done with Argentine Congress really enriched from conversations with think tanks working on in their legislation legislatures, but. There is something that, for me, it's quite. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how it will evolve, but it's a bit scary that we spend so much time now talking to other people outside Argentina. But it's very. Sometimes we, I am. My, my fear is that we 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 need not to lose contact with people mm -hmm. in uh, outside our homes, right? In, in especially in a country like Argentina, where half of our population is living. On the poverty line, so it's very important to get recommendations uh, from CPEC that really reflect what is going on out there, right? So I think it's something that some companies are already reflecting on how they will uh, adapt and, and find their, their people not to be disconnected from reality, especially from those that are having a very bad time now. And I think for us, as think tanks, is also um, a challenge. I don't know. Well, obviously, yeah. it's a very different situation there, but it's also no, it's, a big inequality situation, right? In many ways. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we focus more on international issues, so we're, yeah. we don't focus on domestic issues. But mm -hmm. we have the. It's a very good point because I hadn't thought of it the way you raised it. Because uh, for us, uh, we all of a sudden started getting participation from all over the world. Like you, 140 countries have joined wow. our events. Now, I don't know if that means it's a Brits in 140 countries or if it's nationals of those countries, but we have an expanded reach and we're still figuring out how do we want to capture and hold on to some of these, this expanded reach post COVID when we are back in the office. Mm -hmm. And of course we want to continue to do online events. We want to do hybrid events where people can join us um, uh, online and in, in, you know, in person. But we don't want to lose that expanded reach that we have. <clears throat> but I guess because we don't focus on domestic stuff, it's a bit different. I suppose for you, the, the you know, maybe you could be comparing with other countries and how they manage some of those same challenges. That might be one one approach to it. Um, I, we're you know we're still at, we're a British based think tank, but we have an international mm -hmm. focus. We don't say we're an international think tank like you know double international institute for strategic studies. We'll say we're international. We happen to be in mm -hmm. London. We're not that at all. We're a royal institution. We have, you know, the Queen's our patron, et cetera. So we have, we're very much UK based and UK focused, but we also try to be international. So yeah, the, the, these, you know, I, I think we're all struggling a bit. I, I don't know if you have 
you know, any ideas? And maybe some of the participants might have some thoughts too about, you know, what do we want to be when we grow up? I mean, we're 189, <laughs> 190 years old, but we still haven't quite figured out how do we want to change the way we think about uh, the challenges that we face after, now that we know we can reach so many more people. So it's really, you know, it's a unique challenge, I think. Yes, I have a question, Karin, for you, um, Sipek. As I was saying at the beginning, is uh, 20 years old, and and you you run you run the oldest thing tank. <laughs> so yeah. how how do you get the balance between the DNA of the organization that needs to be intact over the centuries and the characteristics or features of the organization that you think that they need always to be innovating in order to obviously be all the time there and um, important in the policy stage. How do you get that balance? Is something that you reflect every day, something that you reflect strategically some time, uh, from, from time to time? Um, so it's an interesting question. I mean, if, if you're saying, you know, how do we respect our history, but also try yeah. to be forward leaning, right? And some of our trustees get very nervous when we say we were founded <laughs> in 1831 by the Duke of Wellington. You know, they say, stop <laughs> talking about all that. Let's talk about the future. But I, personally, I feel like our history is part of who we are. And in fact, Rus when Russia was founded, the Duke of Wellington felt that after the Napoleonic Wars, that the military needed a place away from the bureaucracy to talk about strategy, basically. And they had public lectures and junior officers could pose questions without being intimidated to senior officers. So in a sense, it's you know we try to keep that same at ethos alive today but you know yeah we're thinking about quantum you know quantum computing and artificial intelligence but we also will have events on military history you know the battle of the Somme, or mm -hmm. you know or other events so we don't have fun you know i don't know about uh, your your thinking but recently we don't have any core funding we don't get money from the government we have to raise everything we do so everything we do in military history we basically do it for free right now because we don't have funding for it whereas mm -hmm. we do have funding for our work on cyber etc I, I don't know if your funding model is similar though we we have a diversified um uh, funding strategy and we we got we get fund from governments when there is a technical assistance for a specific project but we don't get we don't get a any subsidy from government. So we get uh, funding from international cooperation, from uh, mm -hmm. companies in Argentina. Uh, but we, we try to work with different governments in different, uh, because Argentina has very decentralized policy uh, agenda. We, we, we try to work with different governments, but yeah, our funding doesn't come primarily from, from those projects. But is your fund, see our funding is mostly, well, we have membership, but our funding is, primarily 70% is project based so the research teams mm -hmm. apply yes. for grants yeah you same mm -hmm. with you guys okay yeah so you know it's always i guess the challenge we face i don't know if it's the same with you is you don't want to be led by donor uh mm -hmm. you know donor interests but you also can't always sell your ideas so it's often a compromise between the two, between the two right i don't know if it's the same with you yes we have um i think now it's something like 70% of our funding coming from projects and we we get our annual planning in which we decide what are the main issues and we have a different procedures to yeah to get to get all the time clear that we we have our uh, priorities and it's CPEC that has the that has the priorities and not done and on perspective but we are we are having very interesting projects now where there's a consortium of different uh, donors in which they, they have a, a seat at, at some of our meetings uh, uh, from time to time to know how the project is going and, and giving their advice. But we, we get sure that the, the strategic priorities are defined by our board of administration you, and also directors, yeah. But you maintain your independence from the funders like we do, right? Yes, I think but it's something tell me that it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> yes, no, it's critical. No, I was just going to ask about, um, have you been collaborating with more, I mean, so you said you're doing more with international participation, but mm -hmm. are you also collaborating more with other think tanks during yeah. the COVID period as well? More yes. joint events and things? 
Yeah, for 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 us, uh, it was very important that Argentina led the uh, G20 in 2018. That was an important moment for Argentina. And CPEC, mm -hmm. to, together with Cari, another uh, think tank in Argentina, were uh, in charge of T20, the network of think tanks. So that for us it was mm -hmm. a very no, cool. important milestone because we started having more and more links with other think tanks in different countries, not only G20 countries. So now we have, for example, a very interesting initiative um, supported by IDRC of a future of work in the global south and different think tanks from uh, South Africa, um, Brazil, India, and, and other countries in the global south are participating in a big uh, a research strategy on how how we think differently at the future of work in informal labor markets mm -hmm. and in different characteristics of our uh, countries. So yeah, I think it's I, I think it was part of our of of this new stage of CPEC, and so now we're trying to get more and more involved in think tanks in, in projects with other think tanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we 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 and we like doing that too. It gets complicated funding wise, but it's fun to do. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you see, but I, this is a, a very sunny autumn day in Buenos Aires. Yeah. I have the sun entering in. Yeah. Um, no, Karin, I, I have a, a question for you about mm -hmm. uh, how, how was um, uh, how was proceed for you to be now uh, running the think tank coming from uh, where you come and uh, how how is uh, the, the links that you uh, got with the people uh, working in inside Rusi. How do, do you like the internal part of, of the of the work? How how do you balance the internal and the external part of your work? Well maybe it was uh, too many questions, but <laughs> Yeah. So I mean so were you asking about you know being a foreigner at Rusi or was yes. it yeah well let me answer that one first because it's kind of a good question. Sure. Uh, you know it's not that I've just parachuted into Rusi. I'd lived in London on mm -hmm. and off for about 20 years before I took okay. this job. But I had been back in the States working for, first I went to work for an American think tank, CSIS. Mm -hmm. And then I worked for President Obama for almost six years. And so when they hired me, they knew that I had London experience. I got my PhD in London and my MA in the UK. So I had lived in the UK and I'd worked mm -hmm. there and I'd worked at a British think tank before. I think if I hadn't, if I'd stayed in London and I didn't move back, move to Washington, I don't think I would have been as interesting of a candidate. But because I had experience at an American think tank, and I think Rusi felt that, you know, I think that they thought Rusi was going in the right direction. My predecessor had really built up the research programs. And so I think they wanted it to continue in that direction. So, um, but, you know, for sure, when I arrived there, a lot of people had no idea who is this, you know, person. <laughs> coming in um but but i think you know i think generally who knows you never know how you're perceived when you're the boss everybody loves you right um <laughs> but uh i think we're you know we're, we're doing well we've been we've been increasing our funding we were voted best think tank of the year <laughs> this last year by prospect magazine so i think congratulations people are, <laughs> and and we try to be i mean you talked about decentralization we decentralize a lot at RUSI. So I think there is, I think part of the reason we have done so well is because people feel they can control, you know, their, their research agenda and, and, and the way they do their work. I mean, obviously uh, I interfere when I need to and, you know, our deputy and others do, but most of the time people are very good at getting on with it, which is how I, when I w was at CSIS, I was running a program and I had a lot of freedom from my boss and I really did appreciate that so so there's that aspect of it i guess you know a question about balance and i'm going to come back to you on the same question mm -hmm. i find that during covid it's a little bit less fun because i spend more time on internal stuff and i don't get to enjoy the external stuff as much and because most of us aren't traveling and doing the external stuff there, we spend a lot of time probably maybe too much time doing a bit of navel gazing um, and I don't know if you, you know, if you know yes. that expression, but, yeah, but, but I don't know if you're having the same issue. So, you know, it gets a bit tiring all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, over the next few months, things should be opening up more. But what about you? How's the balance in your portfolio? It's always a tension for me uh, to balance the internal and the external part of it. Uh, there's a great uh, team of directors at CPEC. So, they have a very, they are very good leaders. So that's a, I think it's, there's a very good balance in that. 
but I, I, I also have this feeling that over the last year was probably the most stressful year <laughs> mm. at CPEC, uh, especially because, well, all the funding uh, issues with, with these uh, big uh, economic problems in Argentina and also trying to get people feel that they are part of an organization is difficult, especially because uh, CPEC has a high rotation in the, the junior uh, positions of the organization. That's part mm. of what we try to, uh, they, they say, for three years at CPEC and then go to government and then come back and go to study abroad. So uh, people people uh, entering uh, during the pandemic <laughs> was quite a, a big issue for us because we, we want to, that they feel part of the ethos of yeah. CPEC and it was very, it's very difficult. You, you can maintain your social capital, but you can, well, it's very difficult to get new social capital when, when you are working remotely. So yeah. I, I think, well, there, there are some people uh, in the room and I think we're getting a question from Kike at the chat. Feel free to ask. Yeah, yeah we will, just I don't know, Karin, I think it would be great if we can chat with other colleagues uh, here. Yeah. This session. Well, can I ask you one more question before the yeah. <laughs> people pipe in? Because I think one thing we struggle with a lot is how do you measure impact? Um, yeah. Because, you know, we're we, we, you know, we generate ideas, we try to be practical, but our job isn't to implement them. And it's often hard to measure what your impact is. Do you say, well, we were quoted this many times in the news, or, you know, we were invited to parliament to present evidence, or, well, the government looks like it adopted our idea, but maybe 27 other people made the same recommendation. And it's something we struggle with. And, and our trustees are always asking us these questions. And I don't know if you have any good ideas for us. Oh, I think that's uh, the million, <laughs> one million question, right? I, we are we are trying to get more sophisticated in the indicators of the um, impact measurement, but I I don't think they're uh, sophisticated enough. For example, in terms of uh, measuring media coverage, we not only measure how many times we are mentioned, but now we have a kind of quality of the mention. If the mention has to do with a strategic project, it's a better mention than. Uh, I know a different uh, uh, project, and there is some other additional uh, measurement to that. But I think they don't capture what you were and mm -hmm. what the real big question. Um, sometimes, well, from time to time, we have we, with some focus groups and interviews with stakeholders to see how they perceive CPEC from the outside. If they if they get value from mm -hmm. what we deliver, and and I think that. Well, I, I, it's something that I really like and, and, I, and I enjoy um, reflecting on how, how think tanks impact on the policy space. And I, it seems to me that in this very um, chaotic world in which we are living, ideas travel in very, not, not that uh, clear and linear way. And sometimes we, we get uh, some research that has this interesting narrative of how I know some policy should be uh, transforming, but it's it's there in, and and you don't uh, hear anything about that. And then three years later, someone <laughs> gets that idea out mm -hmm. of the a desk, and it's all over there. So I think it's a very chaotic way in which ideas travel nowadays. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, uh, what what do you think about that? Yeah, no, it's it's really hard, and I, and. I can even think of an example where the think tank came up with an idea and the government adopted it and then it wasn't mm -hmm. implemented. The way it was implemented made it very ineffective. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's also, it's, you know, the idea has so many stages, right? It's like a strategy. The government here has just come up with the integrated review and it's, you know, it's a very good review. It's expansive. It's comprehensive. Now they've got to try to implement it. And there's so many stages along the way that people yeah. are, turf interests can block and tackle right and so mm -hmm. and that that happens quite often as well so um so yeah that's that, there's all, all, also that and then you get blamed that was a dumb idea well maybe it wasn't a dumb idea but the way you implement it <laughs> it uh wasn't very good so i think uh enrique is now asking a question to you julia ah uh -huh. yes about the annual uh gala yes i think it's uh well it's a it's a measurement of the uh that that place, uh, that gala, is a place where you want to be seen, you to be, to see other people and be seen, and and because of the plurality of, of leaders that uh, want to be there, 
and they support our gala. I think it's probably it's a, an indicator for influence. But it seems to me that uh, sometimes, especially in Argentina, I know how it's in the UK, um, current uh, policy changes sometimes are not incremental, are quite dramatic. So sometimes there is a very big window of opportunity that it's quite mm. unexpected and you have to be uh, mm. just uh, there to, to react. Um, and I think that's a good a, a good uh, way for a think tank in, in a very chaotic <laughs> policy uh, space. But at the same time, it's very stressful because you are all the time trying to find that very, very uh, short window of opportunity to get your idea uh, on the stage. I don't know, um, how do you see Karin there? That's, yeah, I'm, yeah, I, that's another tension I think we all have in think tanks is how much do you comment on the day to day stuff that's yeah. going on? You know, oh, is Russia invading Ukraine and we're all bloviating mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. versus longer term change and trying to be, you know, entrepreneurial and innovation. What's coming down the pike in five mm -hmm. years? How can our international systems be better placed to manage these kinds of threats mm -hmm. like a pandemic, like a let's just say there's a, a global Internet crash? So it's also a, a challenge to try to balance the two competing, uh, compete, you know, you're being pulled in different directions. And we try to do both. I'm not sure if we always do them so well, um, but I, 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 for galas for us, I don't know, um, Enrique, we, for galas for us are usually just fundraising events over here, less about talking about ideas. Is that what yours is, Julia? It's more about an idea sort of generation uh, yes, event. it's also uh, an event for positioning our uh, mes messages and ideas. I think there is a question for you, Karin, here. Okay, from Mercedes, yeah. So how do we engage with the public? Um, and then, so that's a very good question because there's, you know, we have, we've had these, I'm sure you've done the same thing, uh, Julia, where we spend a lot of time, who are our stakeholders, right? Is it our members? Yes. We have about 2,000 2, members. We have individual members and corporate members, but they're only a small part of our overall budget. We have the people who fund our research. We're a charity, mm -hmm. so we care about the general public. Uh, we also want to impact government. And so we have a lot of stakeholders. And so it's a really good question. That's another area of tension. And we try to do a little bit of everything. And I think, you know, when we go on, we spend a lot of time on the media, all sorts of, you know, media, from everything from social media to traditional mm -hmm. media to talk about our work and to talk about events. So in some ways, I think that's one way to reach the public is to try to clarify and help explain what's happening. Government is different. I mean, sometimes you can have a meeting with 10 people and that's all you want because those are the people that matter in government who are focusing on an issue. So we do also have a lot of private events and we'll, you know, or you'll have visit. I mean, I'm not sure if Julia, you do this as well because I think you're more domestic focused, but we have, you know, visiting officials come to London all the time and then they want to, mm -hmm. you know, go to meetings with think tanks. So you probably have that too, don't you? Well, yeah. they'll come and talk to you and, and, and compare notes. And those are completely private, but they're also great to exchange ideas. And then sometimes I think we just serve as a convening platform. So, mm -hmm. you know, somebody important is in town, Bill Gates is in town, and we're lucky enough to host him. And then the news is there and everybody's filming it. And so we are able to share it with the world. Um, so it's, you know, it's a good question. And, you know, they're all different audiences and each of our research teams are quite independent and doing great work in their areas. They have very different stakeholders as well. So a stakeholder mapping exercise is not a simple exercise, but I don't know, Julia, what about you? I, I was thinking about what you were talking about being convening platform and how it, how, uh, it changed uh, over this year with the pandemic, because for us at CPEC, Although we're having a lot of uh, virtual Zooms with uh, stakeholders, small meetings where we, we say this is under Chatham House rules, blah, blah, blah. But we don't get the same kind of conversation and that, I know, uh, talking to the other one uh, with a coffee before starting the formal mm -hmm. event. Uh, how are you getting those convenient platforms work now in the virtual mode? You mean like the networking opportunities? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I know. I know. We're we're all and the informal, the informal uh, conversation with government officials and yeah. I mean, you just it's just not the same thing because I think no matter how secure a platform is, you always know that they can be hacked and someone can listen in. Yes. So <laughs> the conversations, 
are never are never the same, especially when you talk to government officials about things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're we're now able to have a few private meetings in person uh, at the office, but it's you know it's more complicated than before. So yeah, you definitely miss the networking thing, and that's in many ways. I, I think all of us will be thinking more carefully about travel, for example, for conferences. So in the past, I'd get invited to let's go to Abu Dhabi for this event, and I'm going to be on a platform for 10 bloody minutes. And now I wouldn't do that anymore. You know, now I think about my, my you know, carbon footprint and I think about all the time, mm -hmm. unless I think, okay, I wanna go and speak with the government or I wanna have this networking opportunity or I need to meet with these people, then I think people will, so I think we'll be more selective going forward about the types of events that we will travel to go to versus those that we'll do online. And I think that's probably the same with everybody because Typically, when you go to an all-day conference, there's three or four people on a panel, and maybe you speak for 10 or 15 minutes maximum, right? And so you, it's disruptive. You travel. You have time changes, etc. So you know, you just need to be thinking about your cost-benefit analysis on that. Uh, is that the same with you? Yes, definitely. Uh, especially, yeah, I think that we are going to uh, decide on those occasions uh, based on the networking opportunities, and uh, because yes. Being on a conference, it's not that like, all these uh, type type of conversation that we have is also the part of where we we go for the more informal part, right? Yeah. But now right. now we're having a nice informal conversation, so I think that there is some part of it that we can get, but it, I think for very big trolls, especially from Buenos Aires, very far away from everywhere, it's going yeah. to be uh, yes a kind of trade off about those uh, troubles. Oh, people very, want people yeah, want to go to Buenos Aires. Yeah. No, you I'm think to Buenos Aires? Yeah, people want to go to Buenos Aires. So, you know, <laughs> you, you can't we we would wait for you, Karen. <laughs> I know. I definitely want to come to Buenos Aires. I mean, that's also part of it is people travel to places. When we think about these big conferences that we're trying, we have money to host, you know, you think, okay, as wonderful as the city of Manchester may be, I think we'll get fewer people who want to go to <laughs> Manchester than say we do it in southern Spain or something like that, right? So, I yeah, mean, that's always yeah. a, but then sometimes you need to lock people away. I mean, some of the best conferences are those where there's, you're in the middle of nowhere in a big old house and everyone's trapped together for two days and they can't escape. They can't go up and go shopping, et cetera. Cause then you do get an opportunity to get to know people. So we have a few questions now. Um, I think let's come back to Enrique's cause we'll, he's, he's been very helpful, but maybe we should <laughs> try for the participants first for, from Anna. Have you organized to deal with the rise of distrust of experts? Ah, okay, Julia, I'll follow you. Um, I think in Argentina, um, well, obviously there is this big issue of distrust in experts, but we are having more evidence-based conversation over these days about whether we should close schools or not, what is the evidence behind that? Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, interesting trends about that, and not not so negative. Actually, there actually there has been a. We are all talking about. You you heard? Have you heard these experts saying that or that? I think that uh, there's something a good trend about the pandemic with 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 this. I don't know how it's mm. in the UK, Karen. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, in many ways, I'm hoping anyway that the that the demise of President Trump may Mm -hmm. begin to spell the end of that period. I think, you know, maybe the experts are coming back because I think that the pandemic, exactly as Julia just said, the pandemic has really shown all of us that actually science matters and expertise mm -hmm. matters. And you, we you know, need them. I mean, look at Brazil, you know, Bolsonaro is trying to ignore advice from the scientists and it's incredibly mm -hmm. tragic what's happening in Brazil right now. Whereas countries that have been, you know, paying attention to the science and, and trying to be very careful are doing better. Um, so I do think expertise matters now. And I think, you know, for me personally, uh, you know, if I'm thinking about what kind of leader I want for my country when, when I'm going through a pandemic, I don't want someone who speaks big but isn't good. At, I want the boring accountant type or the lawyer who knows how to get things done. Maybe they're not the best public speaker and maybe they're not charismatic, but they get things done. So I think more and more people are kind of coming to that assumption. And if you look at the countries, obviously, you've heard this before, where you know, where they've done better, it's usually led by women who are probably less into the, you know, oratory, public oratory, more into getting things done. So I, I'm hoping that this is the beginning of the end of these populist leaders, but who knows, we may 
We may, it may not yeah. be, it may just be another blip. But it's true uh, related to what Anna was asking us that uh, there is a lot of this information now going on in social media and in Argentina too. And I think that um, make us think about what is the best strategy for each uh, specific target. And, and also it's related to what Mercedes was asking you, Karin. And I think that for think tanks, it's a very big challenge to realize, yeah. well, if we want to speak to uh, the expert opinion of CPEC to government officials, is a very different strategy than trying to combat this information about some policy issues in on, on Facebook or Twitter. So I think that um, it, it, it will lead us to more sophisticated communication strategies over the next year. So I know how you see, Karin. Yeah, the I board. think, and, right, and there's two aspects to this disinformation. So there's a disinformation of, you know, the anti-vaxxers or yeah. the people who, but then mm -hmm. there's also Iranian, Russian, often Chinese-led disinformation campaigns in Western countries to try to yeah. change you know, the elections, like what the Russians tried to do in the US. And I think governments are realize, like in the UK for sure, that they need to spend a lot more money on countering it, on understanding it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I suspect there will be more research funding out there. So we will, you'll probably engage in a lot of the disinformation at the local level, whereas we will look at foreign interference and disinformation, um, you know, in, in a number of countries. And, uh, you know, we'll definitely focus on that going forward. I suspect though it's going to be with us now because it's so democratized that, you know, all, uh, everything's so democratized and globalized the, the online information world that it's really hard to counteract a lot of it. I just think we're going to be battling with this, you know, for the rest of our lives, basically. Yeah, Karen, I have a question for you, um, because when you, when we met uh, some weeks ago and we were preparing this conversation, you you said something to me that I, I, it kept me <laughs> thinking. But I said, uh, at some point I said, well, in Argentina, we are very parochial and we are all the time thinking about what goes, uh, is going on mm. in Argentina and although there's global information about closure of schools, we're talking only about Argentina. And you, and you, you say something that, Every country is parochial in a way, and and tries to yeah. and and now being based in London and after uh, having those responsibilities in the U.S., how you see those different uh, cultures and how you? I, I would like to ha hear your reflection on that. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone is parochial in many ways, and it, it's probably going to be even more so during a time of a pandemic. Now, part of the problem is, you know. Uh, that countries did not come together as they should have to try to resolve this. Every, it was basically every man for himself in this situation. Mm -hmm. And even though in, privately scientists and companies and others were collaborating at a speed we've never seen before, in extraordinary mm -hmm. ways, countries were not collaborating. They're still not collaborating. They're trying to hoard vaccines. It's me first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they all have a different strategy for dealing with lockdown and borders, et cetera. But, you know, I mean, Americans can be just as parochial. And I think, we're, you know, and Brits can be as well. And when you're looking at, you know, Brexit, or if you're looking at in the US, uh, you know, I was just struck, I think when you and I spoke, it was not that long after the, the January 6 events in the Capitol. And you watch yeah. on American, you watch American, you know, representative senators, congressmen and women, who keep saying, you know, the world thinks that we're the most advanced democracy and this doesn't help. And, and you know, people look up to us as a democracy. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if they do anymore, <laughs> but because they still think that, because it's a, sort of an American exceptionalism way of looking at the world, that everybody wants to be like America. And I don't think it, that's the case anymore. I think the world has moved on. And so, uh, you know, but I don't think they see it. And so for me, that was being parochial. For, uh, you know, I thought they were being mm -hmm. quite parochial. Um, and, you know, it happens in the UK, too, obviously. It's like, well, we should be spending money here. Why are we spending money overseas? You know, so there's always that. Now, I think the one thing that the pandemic has taught us, and I think this was raised earlier by one of the questions is, you know, or it might have been in the earlier panel that Enrique was sharing, is that everything is connected now. So domestic is connected to the global. So the pandemic is domestic and global. Misinformation, as we were just saying, is is domestic and global. Terrorism is transnational now and people get inspired mm -hmm. just online to do things at the local level from what's happening all the way across the world. I mean, the kid in New Zealand who killed uh, all those people in the mosque, 
he was inspired by you know what he had seen online uh, mm -hmm. happening. And so uh, you know this is what's so interesting now is that you can't really distinguish between domestic and international anymore, really. I mean, everything is connected and we need to be figuring out without confusing ourselves about what's connected and what isn't connected. We need to be thinking in more creative ways. Conflicts are more, you know, they talk about hybrid conflicts or gray zone conflicts because you have, you know, the military in this country saying, all of a sudden we need to worry about the Russians trying to interfere in the UK elections. Right? I mean, that's a totally different way of thinking than in the past. So a military has to be prepared for, you know, tanks crossing the border, but they also have to be prepared for cyber attacks and from, yeah. from space and all sorts of things. So it, it's just, it's a richer, more complex in, environment that we're all working in and dealing in. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Yes, I think that it's going to be changing uh, more and more over the next years, right? So it's it's going to be a challenge for us in terms of how we deal with that trade-off between the local and the global, and how we try as think as think tank to help those parochial <laughs> uh, instincts to kind of be sophisticated by the global discussions. And I have a question, Karin, about the generational. Um, um, the, the audience of, of uh, Rusi and how you lead with, with all these new topics about cyber security, I guess that you are also trying to get more uh, younger people into the think tank or talking to a different generation. How Because we are starting at CPEG a very interesting initiative called 4G. D for the 40s of democracy that Argentina is uh, mm -hmm. getting in 2023. Uh, the mm -hmm. first time in our history of, of 40 years of uninterrupted democracy. So, and we are trying to get uh, young, young, uh, younger leaders involved in the conversation about where democracy should yeah. be uh, uh, faced into. So, how is this generational issue, yeah. uh, uh, Rusi? It's a very good question, um, and I also uh, will have a question also afterwards from Leandro, but it's a very good question, and I think we're not where we need to be. That's certainly an area where we need to make improvements at RUSI, uh, but going online has really helped. So, you know, mm -hmm. typically if you came to a RUSI event in our building on Whitehall, you'd see mostly older white gentlemen, and no offense to older white gentlemen, um, but we were trying to make our audience more diverse. And, mm -hmm. we would, you know, I mean, I noticed it, anyone would notice it. The great thing about being online is that you just have much more of a mix. Um, but we are starting, uh, we're trying to start a new program on, uh, we're calling it Next Gen. We've had an under 35s program for a long time, but we haven't really dedicated enough, you know, enough money to making it a success. So we are trying to change that now. And it's, you know, obviously a lot of that's my fault too. I need to do more in that space because you need to bring the younger people in. Um, and I think maybe Rusi in the past, that might've been something, you know, a hundred years ago that Rusi was better. All young, you know, civil servants and soldiers would join Rusi. And it's just not the case anymore that they do that. Obviously mm -hmm. we don't want just soldiers and civil servants now. We want, in addition to soldiers and civil servants, we want, you know, young people from all walks of life, whether they work in cyber or, you know, or if they're just interested in, in, in talking about international politics. So that's absolutely an area where we, that I'm hoping we can capitalize on the learning we've done over the last year um, uh, to, to get much better and have more. I mean, we do have, uh, you know, we have something like maybe 25 percent are under 35 but we just need to increase the numbers significantly, really, and also increase our diversity of our membership. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really an area where we need to make changes. So do you want to answer Leandro's question, Julia? Oh, it's a tough one, Leandro. Hi, <laughs> very nice to hear from you. Uh, Leandro has been CPEC uh, for, uh, some, quite some years ago, right, Leandro? You know, um, I think that leaders in any organization need uh, different skills nowadays, not only think tanks. Uh, you were talking a uh, very interesting point, Karin, you were making about what type of leaders we want to run a pandemic, how to, to uh, deal with a pandemic. And I think that um, the, we, are, we are seeing that also in corporations. We, we need leaders who are empathic, that they, 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 they can be, um, I know they they can they can have some 
uh, reasoning about the evidence and say, well, I, I think I got, I, I, I got brought, I, oh, okay, 2008, 2014. <laughs> Um, I think that there is a there is a very interesting discussion nowadays about how uh, skills of leaders are changing, uh, and 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 I think that part of a um, lot of organizations now being uh, run by females also has to do with different type of skills that are now uh, needed, and I think that it's something that it's it's changing all over the place, not only in in think tanks. And and uh, Karin, I was there was another question. I think it was for you. Uh, uh, about uh, com platforms, uh, because um, you were talking about um, getting to uh, yeah to get more uh, young young people. For us, it's yeah. going it's going to be a big challenge. We're not uh, we we don't have those skills at our organization. We're trying to find mm -hmm. new ways and strategies to get to uh, new generations. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, social media can help. Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying to get a better uh, use of Instagram and also mm -hmm. other. A social media. What what is a, the the strategy of Rusi towards social media? Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of the same. We've just mm -hmm. we we have somebody who is you know full time on social media, and we're hiring I think somebody to replace him. Uh, he left, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we've definitely improved the way we've done that. Um, our Twitter presence and Facebook and Instagram, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I. Yeah, I think we, you know, we're we're uh, launching a new website, thankfully, in June, because our website is still like you can't search on it. So I'm hoping once we get the new website set up, then we can be thinking about other tools that we can use and be more creative, more videos. I, you know, we just need to do some basic stuff, which is traditional media, like having podcasts of our events that are available for mm -hmm. download for people. So when you go on a walk or go to the gym, you can listen to people talking yes. about things if you didn't have time to, to do it um, online and you don't want to stare at your phone the whole time. So, uh, you know, we just need to do some basics before we get too creative with, with new <laughs> tools. But absolutely, we need to, to be utilizing new tools because I think, you know, you're right um, uh, that, um, who, who asked that question? It was, um, I can't even see now. Um, but whoever asked that question was, oh, it was Mercedes. Yeah, you're right, Mercedes, because, um, you know, younger people communicate in many different ways and, and, and reach out in different ways than, uh, than us geezers do. Um, but um, so we just need to be accessible, you know, for, for a diverse group, you know, diverse age group, mm -hmm. diverse. So that's really what the challenge is going forward. I think, you know, we're all just kind of figuring this out together. And it's great we have these tools and these opportunities like today to share, you know, best and worst practices, really, because it's a, mi a bit of a mix, isn't it? Yeah, I think there is, uh, uh, I don't know, Keith, if you want to join us and if there is any other, I don't know, conversation with the other colleagues joining us today, because it's less than 10 minutes to go. We want yeah, to hear and, from you. and nobody's making fun of my big coffee cup, which people always make fun of. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to join and say thank you, uh, Julia and Karen. I have a, I have a, <laughs> I like, I like dinos more than keyboard cups. Um, <laughs> good, good. So maybe we can add uh, coffee. It's a bit but smaller I, though. It's very small. Yeah. Well, yes, it's the biggest, the biggest in the house. So at least. <laughs> but I wanted to go back to my, my question. I, and I appreciate uh, answering everybody's question, but uh, um, I mean, Lucy has, you know, almost 200 years, CPEC 20, but have there been any 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 changes, any moments in the organization's histories that have have involved or you you see as a as a point of inflection? Have yeah, you, a yeah. Moment of change that you might want to reflect towards the end of the session. Or? Yeah, I mean, I think Rusi has had several. Obviously, for, it makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say one of the big ones was um, in the mid. I think it was the mid seventies. Rusi used to own. I don't know if people are familiar with Whitehall, but so we're right on Whitehall. We've got a great location. And directly next to us is Banqueting House. And Banqueting House used to be Henry VIII's dining room, basically. So he had this big, big, beautiful room, building. And then Rusi was built next door to it. And the big building used to be the Rusi Museum. And it was full of all sorts of artifacts and, uh, you know, Wellington swords and things from the colonies. You know, it was, very, it was very sort of colonial in that way. But it was a military museum in central London. And in the 60s, I think it was mid 60s, the government at the time decided they wanted that building back. And so they took it from us and the collection was dispersed. And so the museum was shut down. And now it's a very beautiful building. There's a painted Rubens ceiling 
And most people, you just go in and stare at the ceiling because the, the but there's not much else to do there. So I think that was a big change for Rusi, going from having a museum and a library and a lecture hall. That was a big change. And then I think when my predecessor, Mike Clark, started um, probably about 15 years ago, he really built Rusi up as a research institute. So that was another inflection point because it had previously mostly hosted big military conferences, which we still do. But also he, you know, really built up research inside the think tank. And then I suppose, you know, so I've kind of been continuing that uh, that progression. So those would be the three that I can think of. Thanks. I, I don't know, Kike, if I can uh, speak of biggest uh, moments in, at CPEC after listening to Karin telling all these fascinating <laughs> stories about Lucy. <laughs> we have only 20 years of history. Um, I think it was quite a smooth history over the last 20 years. Maybe the biggest change has been the involvement of the T20 that I was talking before. Uh, it was a very positive uh, external um, event for us. And I think it was quite, yeah, we have four uh, executive directors of uh, 20 years, more or less five uh, each executive director. I'm, I was the first uh, female director and also the first non-founder director. And now Gala Diaz Langu is going to be the next executive director. She's the first uh, executive director, has, has started her career at CPEC. So probably it's a, a very big milestone of our uh, uh, history, but I don't know, not big events as <laughs> Karen, was, Karen was telling us. Well, it's a non, as non um, not negligible, um, I guess. Uh, yeah, <laughs> big deal, I think it's a big deal. Yeah, um, so thank, I mean, thank you very much. We're just running out of time. I don't know if anybody wants to add any comments or questions, but it was fascinating to listen to both of you uh, share both organizational and personal experiences, um, not just from the last year or so, but from from your careers and and history of your your organizations. And um, I think is I, I, a lesson I'll take to the next session, which I think is interesting. That change happens um, in in different forms, right? So yeah. you've described carrying the first one is a if you want an infrastructure change that forces Rusi to to be slightly different, and the next one is about um, what it does, like the, the the practice of the of the institution, that also changes um, uh, the the makeup of the organization, who it hires, and 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 what audiences they reach. Uh, and I find this this effort to reach to new audiences, especially new generations, uh, very relevant. Not just um, not just among among your think tanks, but I think it's quite common across most think tanks. I realize that they have to speak to to people they haven't been used to speaking to in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. No, it's true. I mean, look, it's a, for me, I don't know if, uh, if Julio feels the same way. I feel it's an honor to be directing a think tank because basically you get to spend all day when you're not doing bureaucratic stuff. <laughs> you get to spend all day worrying about things that we all care about. And you can be quite creative in terms of, you know, well, gosh, this is happening in the world. Let's do something about it, right? So yeah. it's it's quite cool in that way. There, It's a privilege. I feel it's a privilege to... To be able to to be able to do that, so uh, you know, it's and it's also a lot of fun though because we're always trying to get better, we're always trying to improve. We always bring in new trustees and new people to support us, and often they have very different ideas about what we should do. So you're you know, there's always tensions and people pulling you in different directions, and trying to balance all those tensions is is part of the job too. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We've got about. Um just under 10 minutes before we go to a final closing session um, where I'll, we'll ask a couple of people to uh, you know, share with us what they've listened to and learned throughout the, these last two sessions. But feel free to join us as well and, uh, and chip in with what you've learned uh, from the session. And if you uh, want to give it a go, go and I recommend you go to the networking uh, uh, space and see who, who you end up uh, meeting and talking to um, about this and other issues. Thank you very much, Julia. Okay. And Karen. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you, you guys. And yeah. Kike, it was Thank an you. honor, Karin, to meet nice. you and talk to you. Bye-bye. Yeah, let's do it again, okay? Yes. yes. <laughs> Good, luck. Good luck in your next job, uh, Julia.